Thank you very much and good afternoon. Uh, I'm very much pleased to be invited to this conference and also it's very pleasing to come back to this city. Actually, Daejeon is a city I first visited in lifetime in, to Korea. Uh, when I came to here more than 20 years ago, uh, Korea was immediately after military regime and for us Japanese, it was a very remote country. We are neighbors, but it was difficult for us to visit here during military regime. I remember that I told to my parents, I'm going to Korea. My parents were very strongly against that. It's very dangerous to visit the country. And uh, it took time for me to explain it, persuade them. Uh, anyway, today I will talk about, uh, probably you may be perplexed to listen to the title, Perpetual Motion, Science, Rationality, and the Image of Nature. Uh, so anyway, first I have to introduce myself and I, I will explain uh, why I took this kind of topic today. Uh, anyway, first I'd like to introduce my University. This is called Tokyo Institute of Technology. Uh, this is a spring uh, full of cherry blossom. Uh, Tokyo Institute of Technology, probably not so many of you uh, do not uh, know, know this institute. Probably it is not known. But anyway, uh, Tokyo Institute of Technology is Kaist partner university uh, in Japan. And uh, mainland China, Qingfa, Beijing is a partner. So. These three universities uh, uh, have a kind of campus Asia. We run the same program, Campus Asia. Uh, Tokyo Institute of Technology is, is established in 1881, uh, three years after University of Tokyo. Uh, so this means that uh, Tokyo Institute of Technology and the University of Tokyo it has a different role, just like Harvard and MIT, and the name of Tokyo Institute of Technology is uh, taken from MIT. Our university changed the name. Original name was Tokyo University for Engineering. But after the World War II, uh, during demilitarization, we changed the name to Tokyo Institute of Technology. And of course, the name is taken from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And uh, Yesterday, uh, in one session, science communication session, uh, there was a video of Fukushima. And you saw three elevens. And at the time of the Fukushima disaster, our prime minister, Japanese government prime minister, was Mr. Khan. And actually, he is graduate of our university. He, uh, was, he majored in applied uh, physics. So uh, when he, the, the things were going on in Fukushima. Uh, he was, as a scientist, he knew what is going on. And he was so much angry about what uh, TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Company, was doing. And when he, he went to, by helicopter to Fukushima Daiichi nuclear site, there was a director waiting for him. Uh, he was responsible for, uh, Mr. Yoshida was waiting for him. And Mr. Yoshida was a younger colleague of him. So he himself was educated in our institute as a nuclear engineer. And one important thing was Professor Khan, he was not, uh, Mr. Prime Minister Khan didn't, was not satisfied with the explanation of, by TEPCO, nor his science advisor. So he made a phone call to our university, uh, he's as an uh, alumni, uh, one of alumni, and so he established contact with our professor and found out they are credible. So uh, the things uh, to solve the problem, uh, ongoing problem, our professors uh, assisted him a lot. So this is kind of uh, the societal role of our university. So this is uh, the leading technology, technical university uh, we have almost 135 years history. Uh, I will talk ab briefly about my, my own as a self-introduction. I'm not a graduate of Tokyo Institute of Technology. I'm a graduate of University of Tokyo. <coughs> For me, when I uh, arrived at Tokyo Institute of Technology, it was very much confusing thing. 
because almost all the professors are technology professors. I was trained partly in science department. I have never seen so many technology professors. And I found out the professors of engineering has, have totally different mindset from science professors. Anyway, uh, I entered the University of Tokyo as a science student, but as a second year or third year, uh, we could change the tracks of education. So I, I decided not to, to continue uh, science education, but I decided to switch to history and the philosophy of science. The history of philosophy of science was uh, not so new, but uh, not so big department uh, and newly developing in Japan. Uh, I wrote my dissertation on British scientist Robert Hooke, and I will explain my dissertation a little bit well, for 10 minutes. <laughs> so uh, one side of my, my talk will be consisted of, uh, uh, in a sense, my history research, and the rest part will focus on perpetual motion. Uh, in 1988, probably you are not born, <laughs> but anyway, 1988, I was I became an assistant professor. RKS, this means Research Center for Advanced Science and Technology. So this was a new research center established by University of Tokyo uh, to promote Japanese high technology. Uh, in 1980s, it was a peak of Japanese high technology and uh, the world market was full of good uh, commodity exported from Japan. Uh, I can't imagine that now, but uh, everyone was talking about the, the miracle, Japanese miracle or something like that. And we tried to boost it uh, by the establishment of Research Center for uh, Advanced Science and Technology. But leading scientists, uh, engineers, I have to say engineers, leading engineers have strong concern for the future of engineering. So they decided to set up small section small section for science and technology ethics in this high-tech institute. I remember the day I, my boss made a phone call. He said, are you interested in this institute? Which kind of institute? This is a high-tech institute. What will, be, I will, be, will I be responsible? You will be responsible for science and technology ethics. Wow. Because I'm trained as a historian of science of the British history of science in the 17th century. But the professors in engineering said, but anyway, you're from humanities or interdisciplinary studies. You may understand something about science and technology ethics. Things were like that in the 80s. But anyway, it was very much a challenge for me because as a history of science, I have to set up something new. So I made a kind of archival study. I read a book and read through books, and I encountered a book which is composed by Professor John Zyman. And John Zyman, uh, he was dead recently, but he was a leading physicist in Britain, uh, born in New Zealand, I think. And, and he, was, he had also, con as a scientist, not engineer, but he had very strong concern for, for the future of science and technology. So his group, uh, not only he, him, but his group, a bigger group, community, started Science Technology Society or Science Technology Studies in, in England. Of course, we have a different counterpart in uh, the United States. Uh, they call this field as Science Technology Society, and in Europe, it tends to be called Science Technology Studies. But anyway, I started to kick off start STS Network Japan in 1990s. I remember the day, uh, 26 March 1990. And after that, this kind of movement for STS became bigger and bigger, and now this network is run by uh, younger colleagues, uh, graduate students, and young assistant professors in Japan. In 1995, I was promoted to Tokyo Institute of Technology. And this was Department of History, Philosophy, and Social Studies of Science and Technology. 
And I believe it's time to set up academic community, not as a network, but academic society. So I propose to my community, let's start Japanese Society for Science and Technology Studies. So I served this, this in, uh, uh, community as a chief secretary, uh, running everything, just like big conference like this. And I continued this for five or six years. And uh, after that, I was so, so tired, so I decided to leave Japan to Hungary. Uh, I did in Hungary was I made a genius studies, Hungarian genius. And I made a history of science, how genius were made in Hungary. Von Neumann, Wigner, many, many leading scientists, Leo Schillard. So these guys actually made big commitment for the development of nuclear technology. But anyway, I'm very much interested in how genius is made. After I came back to Japan, uh, I was asked to, to take the responsibility of the president of Japanese Society for Science and Technology Studies. But during my presidency, uh, Fukushima happened, took place. It was a challenge to our community because Japanese estates community well, used to be, was very quiet. Many of us, we have anti-nuclear -nuc sentiment, but it was not so safe for us. Uh, the, the Japanese society was, in a sense, dominated by the, 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 the money of huge electric company and the government was, uh, didn't like a criticism against nuclear technology. And it was uh, guilty. We are very much guilty to be very quiet to, to the, the thing happening. And we are, in a sense, criticized by the, by the public. STS people are irresponsible for, for, for the, the things going on, this crisis. It was also another challenge. After one year of uh, this Fukushima accident, I, ho I got an email from the Japanese government and they said I should serve for uh, uh, science advisor to the Ministry of Education of the Japanese government and I have to take responsibility for science and society. It's very difficult thing to, to say something in the government. Anyway, it's my role now. I have to continue this for another year. Let's go back to, to the, the, the beginning of my life. So this is my life began as a historian of science. When I started the history of science, this book was very important. Uh, R.K. Martin, very famous sociologist, almost as a founding father of American sociology. He, when he was young, uh, he wrote a very good book titled Science, Technology, and Society in 17th Century England. So this is almost the first STS book, his uh, PhD dissertation in 1938. And this book explained about the uh, socio-economic background of royal society, the royal society. And he had two approaches. One is Max Weber's approach, that is uh, Puritanism, is behind this kind of development. So this is called weber Martin thesis. Another aspect of this book, very important aspect, is uh, socio-economic background, especially technology condition, the formation of the royal society in the 17th century. Of course, you know royal society. Newton became uh, uh, it's president later in the, the 18th century, but the Royal Society was organized uh, 1660, a bit, it's a bit difficult, but the 1660 at the, the Gresham College, London. And uh, this kind of thesis, uh, the Royal Society behind, uh, behind Newton, there was a rapid technological development. This is a very important thesis coined by, by Boris Gessen. Marquis Boris Hessen, well, Hessen, Hessen thesis. And in actually uh, 1930s, it's a very dangerous thesis because Boris Hessen came to London as a Russian delegate and he explained Marxist framework of history of science. But anyway, uh, Martin uh, Marge used two approaches to explain uh, the Royal Society of British History of Science. 
And this is a useful and fruitful resource to understand science, technology, and society. So this is a kind of this book is a kind of must in in in, in, in STS classes. It used to be, I have to say. Now many STS class tend to start with Latul or something like that. Very new and uh, I remember Professor Alan Arwin said, he, his students said, ST was, was began with Latul, your students said, in, in Copenhagen business. But uh, to be exact, ST has, has very long history uh, from uh, 1930s. I was very much interested, I was a student in the 70s during the Cold World War, uh, Cold War. And it was a little bit dangerous. My professor was a little bit worried. Oh, Hideto, you are interested in, in this kind of dangerous thesis. Please t take care. <laughs> you won't be able to get a good job. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't mind. But uh, I had a kind of concession. I didn't directly uh, use Hessian thesis nor uh, Martin. But I took Robert Hook as a case. I was. In, in some reason, for some reason, I was attracted by Robert Hooke since the big, as from the beginning of my research. And actually, this is my book, but uh, my, my uh, paper, academic paper, I talked in the Royal Society in 2003. This was a Robert Hooke Tercentenary Memorial in 2003. Uh, this is a proceedings like book. And, uh, if you are very much interested in Robert Hooke itself, this is uh, our achievement. Uh, Professor Michael Hunter, very famous researcher of history of science of the 17th century, he took the leadership. And Michael Cooper is actually his student, uh, extra degree student. He's almost 70 years old. Let me briefly talk about Robert Hooke. So, uh, you will feel how I moved from history of science and STS and philosophy of science and perpetual motion. So who was Robert Hooke? And probably uh, you know Michael Glafier or Hooke's law in physics, or he discovered biological cell, plant cell. So in England, a uh, new book uh, said, uh, insists that uh, Robert Hooke is British Leonardo. But general image of Robert Hooke used to be like this. They understand. This is Isaac Newton and this is Apple. But anyway, uh, this is headache. This is, this is Robert Hooke. So Robert Hooke is usually understood as headache to Newton. And not so many people understand what Robert Hooke did. But of course, it is very famous. Robert Hooke was, he wrote a very famous book, Micrographia, Micrographia, and this is the, 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 the picture of the uh, cell of coke uh, Robert Hooke wrote. So he is recognized as the person who discovered uh, plant cell structure. So he is a biologist. Of course, physicists, all the physicists know Hook found out Hooke's law. This is actually his book. But this makes us confused because Robert Hooke's research ha had his research has no topical or theoretical consistency. He made research on biology cell to physics, so he must be a, a good, good discoverer who discovered something, but he is not a good theorist or something like that. And he was an enemy of Newton. Newton, Isaac Newton, hated him. They competed very harshly. And Newton was very much resented when his paper was read in the Royal Society, who criticized it. And after that, they continued to call it. So in History of Science book, Hook appears as an inferior scientist, always criticizing great Isaac Newton. This small man, continued to criticize Isaac Newton. I was not satisfied with that image. So I tried, I spent one year in London to make research on, on Robert Hooke. And at one night, I, I found out a very interesting drawings. Uh, this is 
written by Robert Hooke, and it was there was a caption, Robert Hooke's telescope. Telescope? I have never heard about telescope or Robert Hooke. But very much amazing thing happened to me. I was also immediately after that watching, looking at this picture. This is the first official history of the Royal Society, and this is front page, frontispiece of uh, this book. So, so this is a propaganda of uh, Royal Society as the, the first stage. So uh, Royal Society was only seven years old. And they have to insist they're, they're right. We are very much good scientists. We are not alchemists or something like that. And for that purpose, they drew some picture. This is King Charles II and Francis Bacon. Anyway, and full of important things. These things, these people actually support us. King supports us. Francis Bacon is behind us. Great philosopher. But there are instruments, scientific instruments here. What is this? This is Robert Boyle's, Boyle's air pump. But much more amazing thing here. Isn't it a telescope? This is Robert Hooke's telescope. So it is apparent uh, as the beginning of the, 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 the Royal Society, Robert Hooke was identified as a great telescope maker. And on philosophical transaction, uh, this is uh, the, the, the uh, uh, journal, main journal. There is a, uh, pictures of Robert Hooke's uh, observation. So Robert Hooke used microscope, and he is very famous as uh, Robert Boyle's assistant. So he used air pump, uh, air pump, air pump, microscope, and telescope. So I argued in, in my thesis, Robert Hooke was identified as a great experimental scientist who used microscope, telescope, and vacuum pump. This is a rather long introduction, my, my, my background. And uh, if you want to, to know real development of my, 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 my history of science to SCS, please, please read this book in, in, in Korean language, actually. Uh, this is m my textbook for Japanese uh, Open University, University of Air. I have a lecture on science and society for two years, and fortunately, uh, my colleague in Korea uh, decided to translate it into Korean language. Then perpetual motion, finally perpetual motion. I believe I have 20 minutes only. I took much, too much time for self-introduction, but this one. And, this is a very famous Escher's perpetual motion. And I have very much interesting moment. I was just preparing this thing, and my young son, my boy, he is about 12 years old, then 11 years old, came to, hi, dad, what's this? And he said, oh, it's perpetual motion. It's interesting, dad. I want to make perpetual motion. Why? It's interesting. So I recognize perpetual motion is understandable for even small kids, and they are attracted by this irrational thing. Why? And my student, technical university student, said quite similar thing. Oh, professor, I know, of course, perpetual motion machine is impossible, but it's interesting. Strange. Science shouldn't be attracted by irrationality like this. Of course, I don't believe in perpetual motion. It's not rational. But why it is so interesting? <laughs> so uh, one British author, Arthur Oldham, he wrote a book titled Perpetual Motion. And he argued this is a history of an obsession. Very long time obsession. Of course, you know, uh, we have two types of perpetual motion, first kind and second kind. But I omit to explain this. Uh, in this presentation, I simply focus on the perpetual motion of the first kind. Uh, to, in brief, the perpetual motion, which 
create energy from nothing. A perpetual motion machine is very much popular even medieval age. And this is Vilald Onuku's urban balanced wheel. So th this is a kind of lever, lever and the lever fall down and start to move and next thing fall down and fold and started to, 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 to move. So this, this is like this. This is the 13th century. So this kind of overbalanced wheel, which doesn't use any medium, this is a type of uh, perpetual motion. But we have perpetual motion which use, utilize, uses, applies uh, some medium. In this case, uh, air is used for that. This is a bellow and this is windmill, and this bellow move this windmill, and this windmill move this bellow. This is a 16th century thing, and this is British case, uh, Robert Flood, just like alchemist people, uh, uh, if you know uh, Haglid, Haglid, the, the, the British film. Uh, he's like that, but anyway, uh, Harry, po Harry Potter's Haglid. Do you know that? That's a strange looking guy, just like a magician. But uh, the Robert Flood is just like this, and this is Arch Archimedean screw. This is pump and water mill. This pump is driven by this, and the, the water drive this water mill. So, you understand that this kind of thing is very common. And this is also uh, Archimedean screw and windmill. But in this case, uh, uh, John Wilkins, uh, in a sense, one colleague, elder colleague of Isaac Newton. This is a book uh, before the, the, the restoration. But anyway, in this book, Mathematical Magic, John Wilkins didn't introduce, uh, didn't praise this one. He, he, he said it's impossible. He, he didn't say the possibility of this one, but the impossibility of this thing. And uh, so this power is not enough to, 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 to pump up the water or something like that. Uh, he wrote quite similar thing, and this is very famous thing, John Tenier's pillar. So the magnet and uh, uh, steel ball go up, down, so this is so steep. So this is rather easier for him this ball to go up, but this is, this is so steep, go, go down. So, so uh, he, he talked about stupidity of this kind of uh, so, uh, devices. So in the 17th century, people finally became rational. Can we say something like that? The problem is, even the 18th century, people started to uh, make perpetual motion, think about perpetual motion. Uh, this is uh, Jakob Leupold's uh, triple uh, water mill. But th this is a problem. There is a river, stream here. And this moves this one, this one, this one. And th the pump and the water go up and the water go down. And so is this perpetual motion or not? Because this water, this water stream gives power to, to this thing, everything. This really works. But he insisted, insisted this is perpetual motion. Isn't this strange? This is uh, Clo uh, Cox's perpetual motion. This is stored in Victoria and the Albert Museum in London. But this is called perpetual motion. This is, uh, this is a system which uses uh, fluctuation. So this is kind of, uh, atomic pressure measuring things. There is a, used to be a mercury, and this, this, this part go up and down and up and down, and drove this clock. And he said, this is perpetual, so it's strange. There is an apparent confusion of ideas. This system is supposed to produce energy for us. This system takes energy from outside. So this is not perpetual motion, we have to say. Is it possible, or was it possible in the 17th century? 
to say the conclusion first, it was impossible because to demarcate rational thing and irrational thing, to demarcate real perpetual motion and usual machine, we need energy, energy, idea of energy. But in the 17th century people, they don't have the idea of energy. The concept of energy was discovered in, during 1830s and 1840s. So for them, for them means before this discovery, people didn't know anything about energy. So if, if I could go back to this century and I tried to explain, no, no, this is not perpetual motion. This is normal machine because it, it doesn't create any energy. What is energy? <laughs> so uh, during this period, people didn't have any, any framework to demarcate, to, to differentiate rational thing and irrational thing. So we tend to say, I use this thing to talk about paradigm. So if we have paradigm, one framework, we can differentiate uh, rational and irrational. So suddenly, we found that some perpetual emotions are irrational. Some perpetual emotions are rational. So the, the idea, framework of, framework of uh, mindset define rationality. Well, and this is a very famous picture of the change of uh, image of something. So if you see, th this is a nose of young lady, this is a young lady. And if you see, understand, this is a nose of uh, old lady, th this is old lady, but you can't see both. So this is a parad paradigmatic jump or something like that. So I use this thing to explain philosophy of science. But is at all for perpetual motion. As I said, even after that, even after we know nationality, rationality, which is rational or irrational, even science technology students are attracted by perpetual motion. Why? I'm very much curious about this. And I think my temporary idea is we ha must have two images of nature together. In traditional history, sorry, traditional society, traditional society, we had much more productive image of nature, I believe. Agriculture. Agriculture is a kind of perpetual motion because sunshine is the origin of every movement and everything continues perpetually. So we are so much used to see eternal things. And look like, at like this. Mandarin, rice, marron. These things are fruit from the nature. So nature is working perpetually. So my idea is like that. After industrial revolution, well, after a scientific revolution, I should say, we have image of inner of consumptive image. So atoms must be moved, mobilized by energy. This is a kind of typical image uh, after in, in, in the mechanical philosophy. So we need energy input. After Fukushima, we try to talk to many people and uh, we recognize we have pro-nuke people and anti-nuke people. They have strongly incompatible opinions. Uh, Anti-nuke people say we tend to, use, we must use, we must use renewable energy, just like sunshine, photovoltaic, we have this kind of energy. And uh, pro-nuke people say that the energy is so unstable so rare to get, difficult to get, or something like that. And they started to quarrel. 
no, we have enough energy from sunshine. No, no, it's not. And it, it, uh, sunshine is so unstable, something like that. And they seemed to talk about technical feasibility, but sometimes they are talking about their view of nature. This is not my own uh, theory, but uh, my colleague in the Environmental Research Institute, uh, he wrote in a book, uh, actually, the, 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 the argument, antipathy between uh, pro nuke and uh, anti nuke is not technological. That must be uh, the, the, this kind of difference is dependent on the, their, their different view of nature. So, actually, I have, I have very interesting experience. I myself is uh, interested in so-called history of passive house. And I know in Korea, passive house is widely known. Do, do you know passive house? No? <laughs> passive house technology is uh, a kind of uh, house which doesn't houses which don't need much energy with heat insulation, heat insulation and using photovoltaic. And my experience is like that. As I said, my institute, university, is a kind of center of Japanese nuclear technology. So I talk to our professors, do you know passive house? Do you believe in the possibility of passive house technology? Simply, they laugh at me. Hideto, you are so irrational guy. Irrational guy. You believe in renewable energy. Renewable energy is very difficult to use. And uh, we need uh, huge batteries. And it's very unstable. S simply, they don't want to believe in me. But Drastic reduction to zero energy is now possible. So I always say, please check. Oh, wrong English to engineers. Please check your internet. <laughs> and please check Rocky Mountain Institute, uh, Soft Energy Pass, Emery Robbins. And his house on Aspen, so 3,000 meters. This is a passive house. This is a passive house. I visited there. This is me, much younger than <laughs> now. And banana here, without any energy. Aspen is a skiing field, 3,000 meter high. Banana without any energy supply except for sunshine. <laughs> this is a Japanese housing maker. Uh, almost the main part of a Japanese house now is prefabrication, prefabricated. And this is the biggest Misawa home company, zero energy model. This is on the market now. So I always say to engineers, please check this web page. Simply, they don't want to see it. And once I invited Misawa engineers to, to my department, and the engineer explained, if the houses, 50, 50, half of the houses changed into this kind of zero energy house, we don't need any power station. We don't need, we need rather simply huge battery system. But I didn't believe in the engineer's uh, comment because his simulation was very, very you know, not so good. So simply commercial talk. But Recently, I, I saw the, 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 uh, they even released energy creation building. So their technology is really going on, going on, advanced. And so uh, we have uh, not zero energy, but creation energy model or something like that on Japanese market. So what I want to say in this presentation is if you have narrowed mindset, your attitude for innovation will be narrowed. Thank you very much for your attention.